In July 1873, a group of outlaws pulled off a crime that shocked America. It was one of the first passenger train robberies, and the culprits were the James Gang, one of the most notorious in Western history. Jesse James was a thief, a murderer, and a national celebrity. Half the country thought he was a hero, and the rest thought he was a monster. In fact, when he died in 1882, aged just 35, people paid to have 3D photographs of the outlaw in his coffin. This is one of them. It's a stereograph, an early form of 3D popular in the 1800s. Because uh, you need a viewer to see one of these photographs and there are hardly any of them around anymore, it means that a lot of these incredible photos haven't been seen for the best part of 100 years and none of them have been seen on TV in their original format. Now I'm going to raid this lost archive to bring the Wild West back to life. Legendary figures like Billy the Kid, Calamity Jane and Wild Bill Hickok were real people, not just an invention of Hollywood. So from stagecoach rides to gunfights, from rough justice to the real-life cowboys, I'm going to uncover the true story of the West. <laughs> This is cowboy country. Wyoming is at the heart of what we now call the Wild West. For centuries, it was a wilderness where the buffalo roamed and the Indians lived in splendid isolation. But in the late 19th century, all that changed. The tribes were driven out, their land was taken from them, and new people moved west to start a new life here. What we call the Wild West is this huge section of land which was the last great piece of America to be colonised. Until the 1850s, it had belonged to tribes like the Sioux and the Cheyenne, but the land wouldn't remain theirs forever. There was gold and precious minerals out here in places like South Dakota and Montana, and thousands of acres of pasture that could easily be turned into farms. But despite the riches on offer, few Europeans ventured here, People were reluctant to move west of the Great Plains and the deserts of the south. They thought they were too remote. And also, they didn't really understand their potential. But they were also stopped by the politics in America. The southern states feared further expansion west because they thought it would undermine their power by creating rival farms and ranches and markets. So they resisted any attempts to make the territory more attractive to settlers. But in 1861, everything changed. The southern states withdrew from the Union and declared themselves independent over their right to use slaves. The resulting civil war split the country in two and removed the southerners from government. This freed the North to pursue a new Western agenda. They ordered new rail lines to make the West more accessible and they passed the Homestead Act, which gave away 160 acres of free land to anyone willing to farm it. People now saw the West as a land of opportunity and began to move there. When the war ended in 1865, refugees and veterans flooded the area, as award-winning historian and author Paul Hutton explains. The war itself, of course, settled a very important issue in terms of the trajectory of the American Republic. It was the triumph of the urban industrial north over the aristocratic agricultural slave labor south. 600,000 died in the American Civil War, but still you had a lot of veterans now, and they were looking for jobs uh, in the north, a lot of the Irish, and uh, found work on the railroad. But a lot of people were pushing west. A lot of the southerners moved uh, west to Texas. If it wasn't for Texas, my childhood would have been a lot less exciting because it was there that the cowboy was created.
These are Texas Longhorns. And in the Civil War, they roamed about untended in the landscape and produced vast herds. One of those in Texas would have been worth about four bucks. But in the big city like Chicago, it would have been worth ten times as much. And the ranchers soon realised that if they could get them down to the railway line, get them on a wagon and get them to the big city, there was a fortune to be made. But how do you get a thousand of those down to the railway station? The answer was, invent the cattle drive and the cowboy. The first drives began in 1866, the year after the Civil War ended. Slowly, these early cowboys worked out routes across the country called trails to deliver the cattle to various train stops. Soon, those trains were picking up huge numbers of cattle. For example, in 1867, 36,000 cows were sent to Chicago from Abilene in Kansas. By 1871, it was sending 700,000. The cattle trails began snaking their way north, running for hundreds of miles. Moving the herds was a slow business. They averaged about 15 miles a day. One of the longest cattle drives was the Goodnight Loving Trail, named after the two ranchers who pioneered it, Nat Loving and Charlie Goodnight. From the starting point in Fort Belknap, Texas, they drove their herds 800 miles to the final destination, a railway stop in Wyoming. In many ways, the cowboys were like sailors. They'd leave civilization behind and travel huge distances to transport a precious cargo. Only for them, there was no ocean, just an endless prairie. So was their working life as rugged as the movies led me to believe? I went to the White Horse Ranch in Arizona to ask cowboy and ranch owner Russell True about life in the saddle. Russell, has the cowboy's basic kit changed much over the last 150 years? You know, it, it really hasn't changed that much. I mean, it's sort of was the same round wheel, it's just been polished up a little. What about the rope? That's the uh, standard part of the toolkit, isn't it? Well, it really is. Um, you know, and the purpose of the rope is unchanged. You had to run them down, rope them, and restrain them, and that's what the rope did then and what the rope did now. I love the fact that this one's light blue. It's not very butch, is it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, they even have pink ones now. <laughs> they got all kinds of colors, you know, cowboy aesthetics. What's and that you, one made of? This is polyester and nylon combined, and that makes it a little more pliable. But you wouldn't have had polyester in the 1880s. No, you wouldn't. So what they used was what they, whatever they could find. They used cotton, they used hemp, so they used the natural materials that they had available. What about the saddles? The, these are archetypal Western saddles. They aren't are. They, they well, really are. They're actually built around the idea of pressure and pull and torque, aren't they? That's 100% true. And you imagine that you could literally rope 1,000 or, or heavier steer, bull, whatever, going 25, 35 miles an hour, and all the pressure is going to land right here. My eye has been taken by these. They're pretty good. Yeah, those, uh, my wife left these laying around, but they're, they're sort of classic cowboy boots. They've got the, the high underslung heel, the high uppers, protection against snakes, thorns, etc. but mostly snakes. So basically cowboys look the way they do because of the functions that they perform. No, yeah, absolutely. The fact that you all look so cool is just a coincidence. <laughs> that part I don't know. These stereographic photographs show the men who created the blueprint for Russell and generations of ranchers. They pioneered a way of life which Mark Twain saw as being purely and distinctly American. But did the movies I watched as a kid get it right? Do my big screen heroes live up to the real thing? To find out, I asked cowboy historian Clay Gibbons. Those cowboys were known to be out months at a time without sleeping under a roof. Months at a time without sitting on a chair, Tony. Their only chair was their saddle or sitting on the ground in front of their fire when they were cooking up whatever they could find to eat. In some instances, after a cowboy's work was done in the fall, after they gathered up, his job then would be to ride to the south, hundreds and hundreds of miles, looking for stray cattle that belonged to his owner. He would be off on his own. 
And so that, that loneliness, the ability to live on your own, to be satisfied with having nobody to talk to but your horse, to be over dry country without food and water for days at a time, it, it was either to get tough or, or die. They had to be tough to survive. They had a lot of grit. Dangers on the trail included hostile Indians, rustlers, outlaws, snakes and wolves. But the biggest threat was the cows themselves. I've got an article here about a herd of cattle that were spooked by a lightning storm. It was written by a guy called Teddy Blue, who was one of the most famous of the Western cowboys. He wrote, It took all of us to hold the cattle, and we didn't hold them. And when morning came, one man was missing. We went to look for him, and we found him among the prairie dog holes beside his horse. The horse's ribs were scraped bare of hide, and all the rest of the horse and man was smashed into the ground as flat as a pancake. All you could recognise was the handle of his six-shooter. Being trampled to death in a stampede was a common occurrence. And even if they did survive a drive with their life and limbs intact, few made the trip more than once. Movies and TV westerns never showed men broken by the trail rides. They didn't spell out how long it took to complete one either. And as an act of sheer endurance, it's pretty impressive. But what happened at the end of the trail when they got off their horses? Well, they didn't drink milk. The end of a happy trail meant they opted for something much stronger. Oh, can you imagine what that first drink must have tasted like? That's one myth about cowboy life that Hollywood did get right. The way those saddle-weary, sandpaper-mouthed, tough guys really lived it up at the end of a long, long ride. The end of the trail was where the wild times really started. This is where the cowboys crossed swords with the gamblers, the good time girls and the gunfighters. Part of what made the West wild was the way the cowboys let down their hair at the end of a long cattle trail. Trail stops became trouble magnets as gamblers, saloon owners and prostitutes moved in to separate the cowboys from their hard-earned cash. In the movies I watched, these were places where the cowboys settled scores with gunfights in the main street. But is that what really happened? According to firearms expert Gary Harper, apparently not. Gary, you've ruined it for me. All my childhood dreams have turned to dust. I've come here all tooled up for a gunfight, and you're going to tell me it's rubbish, aren't you? Well, if you're doing a Hollywood gunfight, you're set up just the way you should be. I want to do a real gunfight. Well, it didn't happen this way. The holster, the rig, this, this is all Hollywood. So if two guys wanted to have a fight, they wouldn't stand opposite each other like this and go like that? No, it, it, they're both going to die. I mean, um, this is kind of like a duel. You're going to turn to present the the smallest target. Yeah. You want the, the farthest distance that you feel comfortable shooting at. So really like an old-fashioned English duel, where you go a long way away from each other, you get out your gun, you rest it on your arm and fire like that. Just not so polite. <laughs> uh, if both shots go off and nobody gets hit, they're satisfied, the consequences of the duel have happened, and uh, all is forgiven. You start over again. One gunfight that did take place was a duel that created a legend of the West, Wild Bill Hickok. Hickok had a colourful past. He'd been a scout and spy for the North in the Civil War, a buffalo hunter and a marshal in a couple of cow towns. But Bill was also a gambler and that led to him taking the law into his own hands with a gun. Wild well, Bill is uh, one of the few real gunfights that takes place in the West. It's in Springfield, Missouri. It's with a character named Dave Tut, and uh, they meet on the town square, and uh, they both draw and they both fire, and Bill kills him. Kills him over a watch that Bill had lost in a poker game, although the story was there was also a woman involved. But uh, it was a sensation. The incident made the front page of Harper's new monthly magazine and turned Bill into a national celebrity. The reason? 
A successful gunfight was a rare occurrence, as historian Chris Enns explains. Generally, if someone is shooting at you, it's hard for you to shoot them. You're trying to duck and aim, and it took somebody like a Wild Bill Hickok, who was very deliberate with the draw, very slow to respond, even if the bullets were flying around him, to stop, pause, draw your weapon, aim, and then shoot them down. And that's why he was known as the most deadly pistol arrow in the West. Hickok went on to kill at least five more men as a lawman. Instead of landing him in jail, it put him in a theatre. The public's fascination with the West saw Bill become an actor playing himself in a show called Scouts of the Plains. He wasn't very good, and ironically for a natural-born killer, he found himself dying on stage every night. And away from the footlights, real life was catching up with him. No career on the stage. He wasn't a play actor. He was the real thing. He was going blind, and uh, that worried him. So his career as a lawman was closed. He spent all of his time drinking and gambling. In 1876, age 39, but with his health failing, Hickok arrived in Deadwood, South Dakota, to start a career in mining. This is a 3D photograph of Deadwood, one of the most violent and vice-ridden places in America. The fading gunfighter lasted just three weeks there before he was killed. He was murdered while he was playing poker. He was shot in the back, actually. And at the moment of his death, this is the hand that he was holding. One, two black aces and two black eights. Famous now as the dead man's hand. That story didn't emerge till about 50 years after he died, so it may well not be true. But true or not, that wasn't the first or last time that fact was blurred with fiction in the life of Wild Bill Hickok. Even as he lay cold in the ground in Deadwood, Hickok's life was being woven into a tapestry of half-truths and downright lies. For example, popular fiction gave him a beautiful and deadly female lover called Calamity Jane. In reality, she was a drunken fantasist and former prostitute who Hickok met briefly and openly despised. She was buried next to him as a joke, but their alleged romance spawned a Doris Day musical. Hickok wasn't a nice man by any stretch of the imagination, but for decades he'd be cast as an honest Western hero. And the reason for that was the Civil War. I find it fascinating that the legacy of the Civil War plays out in the story of Western heroes. Jesse James is very much a, a Southern hero. While Bill Hickok, on the other hand, is a hero of the Union during the American Civil War. So if Jesse then becomes an outlaw, while Bill Hickok becomes the hero. No story better demonstrates the influence of the Civil War on the myths of the West than that of the outlaw Jesse James. Jesse was born in Missouri in 1847, and age 16, he went to fight in the Civil War with his brother Frank. When it ended, they continued to fight a guerrilla campaign against the victorious North by robbing banks and settling scores. He is self-conscious about his legend. Part of the game he played was uh, the resistance of the true Southerner against Northern aggression and, uh, and still fighting the Civil War. And he, that played very well in Missouri, but nationally, um, it really was the struggle against the railroads, the struggle against the banks, the big insurance companies, and all that resentment is there. And Jesse James and other Western outlaws play off that. And uh, you can never lose being against the big bankers, being against the big stock jobbers. Uh, that's always good politics. Jesse wanted the public to see him as a good guy, a Robin Hood character, and so began writing letters to Southern sympathising newspapers, defending his actions. A great many say that we robbers deserve hanging. What have we done to be hung for? It's true I shot a little girl, though it was not intentional, and if the parents will give me their address, I will send them money to pay for the doctor's bill. Just let a party of men commit a bold robbery, I'm doing an accent now, 
and the cry is hang them. But President Grant and his party can steal millions and it's all right. Some call us thieves. We are not. We are bold robbers. We rob from the rich and give to the poor. Except, of course, he didn't. He kept the money himself. Jesse's love of publicity raised the gang's profile, making them a big target. His old Civil War buddies could see that their time was running out. One by one, they left. Even his brother Frank hung up his mask and gun. In 1876, he was going with a uh, much lesser class of, of outlaw accomplices. Um, he's sort of an early organized criminal, but they're not very well organized. And of course, as often happens with organized crime, uh, he's betrayed. But the very betrayal, of course, adds to the romance of the story to many people. On April the 3rd, 1882, recent recruits to the gang, Robert and Charlie Ford, murdered Jesse James for a $5,000 bounty. This stereographic photo of Jesse lying dead in his coffin sold all over the States. A stage show that reenacted his cowardly assassination toured theatres across America. So, the climax of the show was this. Jesse is sitting down to breakfast and um, he's talking to the Ford brothers. They're planning their next big robbery. Jesse gets up, he notices some dust on the picture frame, starts dusting it off. Meanwhile, Robert Ford gets out his gun, creeps up behind Jesse and BAM! Shoots him through the back of the head. And who starred in this show? Robert and Charlie Ford, who reenacted the murder they'd committed night after night to packed houses. Was that weird or what? When Hollywood went west to look for new material, Jesse's colourful life and ultimate betrayal made for a great story. But as well as the tragic outlaw movie, the other classic cliché is the small, honest cowboy standing up to a corrupt big landowner. And that, it seems, was pretty much on the mark. The cattle barons who had carved out empires in the west found that their way of doing business was under threat from thousands of incomers. A new fight was about to begin over who would run the Wild West. Cowboys riding the range. A classic image from the movies of my childhood. But the cowboys only had this country to themselves for a very short time. The first cattle drives started in 1866. But almost immediately, new towns sprang up on the prairie and railway lines began to shrink the wide open spaces. More settlers began arriving here, looking to make a new life. They were called homesteaders. And as historian Tom Hatch explains, these were the real people who tamed the West. There was the Homestead Act, and there were several other acts where you would gain a, a X amount of land if you would work it for a period of time. These people uh, wanted communities. They wanted schools for the kids. They wanted churches, which were the social centers. The real heart of the West was the homesteader, mom and pop and the kids. These are typical homesteader cabins. They're part of a collection of original Western buildings on display at the Old Trail Town Museum in Cody, Wyoming. Cowboy historian Clay Gibbons helped salvage some of the buildings here. What would life have been like for the people who originally lived in these? Most of us couldn't handle it, Tony. It was a tough life, very, very remote. Most of these buildings were hundreds of miles away from maybe even their neighbors. OK, so tell me about this one. Uh, it's one of my favorite cabins. This is the Morrison cabin. 
Back in the early 1880s, Luther Morrison decided to start a sheep ranch out in the middle of Wyoming. He was still engaged in business in Rock Springs, Wyoming, so he moved his wife out to this place. Lucy Morrison was camped out there tending their sheep, living in a tent with three little kids. Now, when she had to leave her tent and move her sheep to water or to better grass, she only had one thing she could do with the kids. She couldn't take them with her. She tied them to sagebrush. She did leave a dog to protect them from wolves, leaving them for the day and praying to God that when you got home, your kids were all right. That's the pioneer spirit, isn't it? It was a tough life. Now, in 1884, Luther moved out and built her this very small cabin. Now, when he built this cabin for her, she thought she was living in a palace, as you can imagine. And then he was there also. But the interesting thing about Lucy, she didn't see another white woman for five years. Can you imagine a woman not having her mother, her sister, her best friend to talk to for five years? She was a tough, tough woman. The cowboy movies I watched when I was a kid never featured any women like Lucy. But women like her had more to do with the taming of the West than I ever realized. That was who occupied a lot of the West, women. And they came with the same ideas that men did, wanting to settle a portion of the territory for themselves. They did indeed come with their husbands and they had children. And how were they going to be able to provide for these children? They couldn't give up what they were doing. They had to press on with taming the land, making sure that they could do this job. And they did. Some women even made sure that their children got all the way through college. Homesteaders like the Morrisons were cutting the country down to size as more and more people moved west. This is what the government had wanted to happen. This was the America they saw emerging from the Civil War. But these new westerners weren't always welcome. This land had been a cash cow for the big cattle barons, who so far had had it all to themselves. They didn't want to share it, and this led to a new kind of conflict called a range war. Range wars were a fight for grass, and it was fought mainly between what I like to call the haves and the haves not, Tony. It was the big money people that owned the ranches that came here originally, and the small rancher who was trying to survive also. He was using everything legal to establish himself on a homesteaded piece of ground, but it was always the best ground, and that's what upset the big guys. Until now, all this land had been free for them to graze their animals on and make fortunes. When the new farmers arrived, few could afford to fence off their property, so the big ranchers could ignore any boundaries. But then a little invention came along that changed everything. Barbed wire was one of the biggest innovations to hit the Wild West, on a par with the riverboat, the railroad and the repeating rifle. In a nutshell, it allowed homesteaders to quickly, cheaply and efficiently fence off their land. Suddenly, the range wasn't so open. Range wars, gun battles over who owned the land and the cattle on it, broke out across the West. One of the worst was in Johnson County, Wyoming. It centred on the wealthy ranchers who met here at the Cheyenne Club. Who did the fighting? The big landowners, they came in to put a squelch to this. Interestingly enough, they were very political, they did their homework, and they let it known all over the country in the big papers of the day that these cattle rustlers were stealing them blind, that someday somebody was going to have to do something about it. They convinced the public out there that it was inevitable. There were people stealing some cattle, but nothing like the numbers claimed by the Cheyenne Club. But by discrediting the opposition, they gave themselves an excuse to act to restore order. They put together this private army of mercenaries and sent them to Buffalo, which they saw as a stronghold for their enemies. When these gunmen went to war, they did it in style. In April 1892, a special train was making its way through Wyoming. On board were horses, tents, blankets, ammunition, explosives, and 46 armed men. Among them were 22 hired guns, like the assassin Tom Horn, and they were going to be paid $5 a day, plus $50 for any murder they committed. Also on board were a surgeon and reporters who were going to act as war correspondents. 
The hired guns were nicknamed the Invaders, and they had a hit list of 70 suspected cattle rustlers and agitators. But their mission fell apart when, instead of sticking to their plan, they decided to try and capture one of their targets ahead of schedule. The biggest thing they did wrong, they found a cowboy by the name of, and I think one of the best names in Western history is Nate Champion. Love that name. Well, the big outfits knew that Nate Champion was the head of the cattle thieves, okay? Well, they found out that he was holed up in his cabin. They diverted from their plan of going straight to, to Johnson County, straight to Buffalo, and they went over to take care of Nate Champion. They got there that morning, they hid behind the corrals, and the fight ensued all during the day. And Nate Champion was keeping a journal, and he kept writing about the bullets are coming in like hail. Nate's last word in his journals were, the cabin is afire. I'm going to have to make a run for it. Goodbye, boys, if I never see you again. Nathan D. Champion. He opened the door and fled out the back of the cabin. He was met with a barrage of bullets. Another man by the name of Jack Flagg saw what was happening. He escaped then alerted the town and the citizenry of Buffalo, which came up in arms. A posse of 400 enraged locals chased the invaders out of town. The mercenaries holed up at a nearby ranch house and remained there under siege for three days. The Cheyenne Club called in some favours and the president, Benjamin Harrison, sent in the cavalry to save the hired killers. The government connection may have got them off the hook, but the ranchers had lost the war and their grip on the landscape. Just like a Hollywood movie, the little guy had won. But the West was changing, the towns were growing, and the big businesses were moving in. There's a sort of urban frontier, a town frontier, so almost immediately you have this conflict between that rugged individualism and, and corporate America, and, and we see that conflict running through the whole story of America. The modern world was reigning the West in, but before they rode off into the sunset, the last generation of outlaws would go out with a bang. In the Wild West movies I watched when I was a kid, the cowboys carried out rough justice at the point of a gun. In real life, cowboys hardly did anything like that. But one former ranch hand did become infamous for taking the law into his own hands. He would become one of the biggest names in the West. Legend has it that in 1881, a notorious teenage gunslinger was brought before a judge and tried for a series of murders. He was found guilty of 19 killings in total, and then the judge delivered his sentence. He said, son, you will be hung by the neck until you are dead, dead, dead. And immediately the boy shot back, you can go to hell, hell, hell. The boy was William H. Bonney, otherwise known as Billy the Kid. He was born Henry McCarty in New York City in 1859 and adopted the alias Bonnie after getting into trouble stealing horses in Arizona. This is the only fully verified photograph of him. The original was recently sold for $2.3 million. Bob Bosbell is the editor of True West, the world's longest-running cowboy magazine. He's also a big fan of the original teenage delinquent. I think you can draw a direct line between uh, Billy the Kid to uh, James Dean, uh, Elvis Presley, Kurt Cobain. It's the good bad boy. It's, it's dominated in media now for more than a century, and it started with Billy the Kid. Did he really tell the judge to go to hell, hell, hell? No, he did not. That's one of those uh, wish he had. That's a great line, and it, it probably stems from the movies. Hollywood loved Billy's story but seldom told it as it really happened. Billy was a low-level criminal who went to Lincoln County, New Mexico, to work on a ranch. The Lincoln County Wars, probably the most notorious and the most bloody of all range wars. You had um, two Irishmen that came into the area who were military men who were with the Civil War, and they controlled everything. James Dolan and Lawrence Murphy ran a monopoly on all aspects of county life, from the sheriff to the local shop. 
They controlled the cattle. They controlled what goods were going to be coming into the area. And they charged people an exorbitant amount of money to get their goods, but they wouldn't allow anyone else to come in and set up shop. But Dolan and Murphy's stranglehold was challenged by a rival partnership of lawyer Alexander McSween, legendary rancher John Chisholm, and an Englishman, John Tunstall. Tunstall would become the first high-profile casualty of the turf war. Tunstall was coming into town. He saw Murphy's law enforcement agents that they paid for, a sheriff by the name of Brady, and approached him to talk about the situation. And Brady's men shot Tunstall down. And the men that worked for Tunstall, which included Billy Bonney, the famous Billy the Kid, was outraged by this and everything just went to hell. Both sides began a series of tit-for-tat attacks. Things escalated into a siege and a gun battle at McSween's home. His house was set on fire and McSween was shot when he tried to escape. The kid was one of the few to get out alive and he vowed that he'd kill anyone who was involved in the murder of his friends, which he did to the best of his murderous ability. He thought he was fighting for a cause. He, he was a funny boy. He, he said things like, uh, there's been 250 people killed in the Lincoln County War and I didn't kill all of them. That's a, that's a, that's a kid that has a little bit of uh, self-effacing humor about him. He's very likable unless you were killed by him. Legendary Western lawman Pat Garrett was made the new sheriff and was ordered to bring Billy in dead or alive. On the 14th of July, 1880, he traced Billy to a ranch house, surprised him, and shot him as he walked through the door. Not everyone was happy with the killing, but Garrett had a novel approach to deflecting criticism. He employed a journalist to help him write a book called The Authentic Life of Billy the Kid. It was published nine months after Garrett shot him, and it made Billy a legend. The book painted the kid as a cold, charismatic killer and Garrett as a heroic lawman. It was all tall tales and spin, of course. Billy was just a very violent young man with a cool nickname, not a criminal genius. Very few outlaws were that smart or tricky, although one man bucked the trend. Butch Cassidy was a rarity, a successful smart bank robber. Alongside his partner, the Sundance Kid, he ran a gang called the Wild Bunch. They operated out of a little wooden cabin in the Hole in the Wall Canyon in Wyoming. This is it. This is the cabin where the Hole in the Wall gang, or the wild bunch as we sometimes know them, hid out after every robbery. They were so tough they had two names. The cabin is the star attraction at Old Trail Town Museum, thanks to the Paul Newman and Robert Redford movie, which made the outlaws icons for my generation. Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid were real people, weren't they? Absolutely real people. Uh, Robert Leroy Parker and Harry Alonzo Longabaugh, alias Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid, assembled and commanded the last of the great outlaw gangs, the Wild Bunch. They planned and executed bank robberies, train robberies, and they were never caught. Jesse James and his gang may have been among the first to rob trains, but the Wild Bunch turned it into an art form. On June the 2nd, 1899, an engineer from the Union Pacific Overland Flyer No. 1 fired off a telegram from Medicine Bow, Wyoming. It read, First Section No. 1 held up a mile west of Wilcox. Express car blown open, mail car damaged, safe blown open, contents gone. They made off with $50,000, some of it in gold. This is a picture of just a few of the hundred strong posse that chased the gang. They all had their eyes on a thousand dollar reward for each of the gang, dead or alive. But the Wild Bunch were one step ahead of them. Butch spent as much time planning the getaway as he did the robbery itself. He started relay systems where out in the woods, in ranches, miles down the road, he would have fresh horses. So as the posse was gaining on them, 
they would change horses, and off they would go to outdistance the posse. This is the most famous photograph of the gang. It was taken after a bank robbery in Fort Worth, Texas. The gang had this photo taken as a souvenir after they escaped and then went off to whoop it up in a part of town called Hell's Half Acre. Unfortunately, a copy was put up in the photographer's studio and a Pinkerton's agent spotted it and used Butch's head on a wanted poster. The Pinkertons were the elite detective agency of the West. A private police force, they'd been hired by the banks and railway companies to catch the gang. Butch and Sundance were running out of time. They ran headlong into the 20th century. No longer were local posses chasing them. They were being hunted down by a sophisticated system of technology where photographs could now be sent around the country. None of the men in this photograph lived past the age of 45. No matter how effective their hold-ups had been, the world was changing. Two of the gang were smart enough to see it coming. In 1901, Sundance and his companion Etta Place left New York along with Butch to live in Argentina. They started a cattle and horse ranch, were very, very successful, and uh, unfortunately that larceny in their heart uh, caused them to start robbing. They made their mistake in Bolivia because they stopped a mining payroll out in the wilderness with two people guarding it. And they could, any, any outlaw worth his salt, they would have killed the two people, no witnesses. But instead, Butch let them go. And that was their downfall. They were tracked to a town called San Vicente and they were killed there. There's a lot of myths that they actually lived, but um, it's typical of, of icons. You can't bury them deep enough because somehow they won't stay dead. And, and that was the case with Butch and Sundance. So I'm at the end of the trail. I've rounded up my childhood heroes and ridden back to the ranch. I've come here to visit modern-day cowboy Russell True, the owner of the White Stallion Ranch, to ask him, are real cowboys still out there? What's changed for them? Well, I think you have to inject a little technology, and, and then, you know, as the cities have grown, uh, the cowboy's world has shrunk. But the, the rural west, still driven by the cowboys, you know, and that's, that's cowboy spirit and cowboy skills, and they need them both. With the world changing so fast around us, it's easy to think of the cowboys as heroic figures from the past. But to know that there are still real cowboys riding out there on the range, in some way, it's pretty reassuring. Next time, the legendary showman Buffalo Bill, Wyatt Earp and the gunfight at the OK Corral, and the last rebel Geronimo.